This conference will now be this conference will now be recorded. Okay, so uh, we are recording the session, and I will hand over to uh, my colleague over here, uh, Nico. Take it away, Nico. Yeah, thank you, Christoph. Um, so, from my point of view, also thank you very much for attending this first online session of the Theme User Group of Belgium and Luxembourg. Um, first of all, we have a couple of house rules. So, as, as uh, Christophe also mentioned already, we will be recording this session and please put your camera off and uh, you put yourself on mute. Uh, uh, we knew that uh, there will not only be Dutch speaking people in the session, so we're doing the session in, uh, in English, otherwise we would do it in Dutch. And of course there is room for interaction and questions and please hold your questions after a slide or two slides. We will uh, mention when this can be done, otherwise it's too much uh, interference. So, what is the content for today? First, we have the introduction. We will introduce ourselves for those who doesn't know us very well. Secondly, um, I will talk about securing your backups and hardening your Veeam backup and application server. I will point a few new uh, V12 features in securing that. And at, and at, at last, but not at least, uh, Christophe will mention a few of the uh, most interesting uh, features in V12. Yeah. So let's start with the introduction. Uh, for those who does not know me very well, I'm Nico. I'm working as an infrastructure consultant and architect at Orbit. Orbit is a, a service provider and gold partner and service provider in Belgium. Uh, my main focus is on virtualization, backup disaster and storage. But at first, I'm the Veeam expert in the company, so most of the time I'm busy with that. Uh, next to that, I'm also uh, fond of uh, Data Core. Uh, I implement that also. I uh, am from the very beginning a Veeam legend. It's now my third year. It has been renewed, and um, I'm also together with Christophe, a Veeam user group leader of the Benelux, of the Belux, excuse me, not Netherlands. That's a separate. Uh, uh, apparently, it's a separate uh, user group. Um, everybody that knows me knows that I'm want to uh, have a high level of uh, implementing. So therefore, I love uh, defining and implementing best practices. Christoph, will okay. you introduce yourself? Uh, thank you, thank you, Nico. Uh, for those people who don't know me, um, I'm one of the founders of Integri, uh, a managed service provider with a strong focus on Veeam and Veeam products. We have developed our own uh, Cherry self-service platform for Microsoft 365, which goes through the whole spectrum of cloud aggregators until end users to do some uh, self-service tasks and monitoring on their Microsoft 365 environments. On the other hand, uh, I'm, as uh, Nico already mentioned for himself, working with Veeam products as from the beginning. I um, worked with the products since it was still named Fast SAP. So uh, I did a lot of uh, expertise on, on those products uh, the last couple of years. And I'm, uh, I'm glad to be part of the, the VUG, uh, the user group since this year uh, as a leader. And also it's an honor to be uh, Veeam Vanguard as of this year. So um, if you have more questions, don't hesitate and uh, get in touch with us for more details on that. Okay, right. securing your backups. Yeah, now we will start with the real content. So why is it needed to secure your backups? First of all, as everybody knows, uh, to protect yourself against ransomware. Uh, not only ransomware, but also hackers. Insider theft is also something that is uh, popular these days uh, against the disasters, physical failure and software failure. Why is that? Because it says itself, backups are often the last resort in many cases. So if your backups are not secured enough, you're with your uh, back against the wall and you have to, you have no solution anymore. So that's why it is so important to secure your backups. Do you want to add something about that, Christophe? Oh uh, no, there are a lot of types of protection. And I think in the next slide, we talk about physical protection. Eh? Yes, that's the first thing. So, um, of course, your backups are need to be uh, located in a, a locked server room. Yeah? Uh, it speaks for itself that not everyone 
may have access to that server room where your backups are situated. Uh, next to that, uh, if possible, Im implement biometric uh, secure uh, uh, access. Uh, also camera surveillance, limited access for only allowed people, so most of the time only IT related people of course. Uh, four eyes principles is sometimes uh, handy. I know in the SMB market that is not always uh, that convenient, but in uh, more larger enterprises that is needed, so two people uh, are having, uh, have to be at the same time having access to, to your backups and always use of implement encryption if uh, you are putting a backup copy or so to removable uh, media. For example, if you are putting a copy to a uh, rotated disk or to tape encrypted because if someone gets to that, uh, he can, without an encryption, he can remove, uh, he can restore your whole infrastructure if he sees that it is a Veeam backup he restores it without any need of a credential. Afterwards, of course, if your infrastructure has been restored, you need, of course, your Windows credentials and so to, to get in, but that's a matter of time. There are possibilities to do that. So use encryption if it is not located in a secure physical uh, location. Yeah. It all depends, of course, on your level of paranoia what are you all implementing of those possible features but there must be at least one minimum of security that you implement yeah i think the best thing is to do at as much as possible eh? in the past i've seen a lot of backup servers just sitting under the stairs of, uh, of an office uh, of course you can do much more and it really depends what are the capabilities how much is, is the budget how much can you invest but uh, keeping a certain level of physical protection is, uh, is of course, a, a, a no-brainer. Yeah, the next one, that's something I always talk about it when I'm talking to uh, customers. Most of them, most of you should know it by heart, but I will explain it once more. No problem for me. So that is the golden backup rule. Eh? First of all, that is existing already for years. It was a three to one rule. In the last five years or so, they have added a one and a zero afterwards. So to recapitulate, what will it mean? The three stands for you have to have three different copies of your data. So it means your source, your production data, one backup and the backup copy. Uh, the two stands for two different media, for example, on a disk and a tape or disk and cloud or disk and service provider. It can be also two disks. I am getting often that question, that's no problem. But then I strongly advise to do not use two the same two same uh, devices of the same brand of the same type uh, purchased at the same time. So the disks are probably also created at the same time. So if there is a, a, a certain a topic of a certain issue with that kind of disk, then you could have the law of Murphy that it, the boat at the boat devices it is uh, getting um, uh, you, you have you have that issue on the Same boat issue. devices. Oh. Yeah, so try to avoid that. <clears throat> then the one is you put one uh, copy of course of site, so that uh, helps you in the case of a disaster. So if you have one main headquarters building and you're uh, putting one um, copy of your backups with a tape or so that is being transported or to a service provider, whatever is the option, then it can help you if a fire or a flood, whatever happens to your main building, that you still have a backup. I know it's not always a possibility to, to restore everything, and that is the, the company is uh, broke. Uh, how do I call it in English? Um, fight. Uh, broke. broke. Yeah. yeah, it's broke. But uh, it's still sometimes needed to, to restore your, your data, and it can help you to restore it in, in the whole thing. Then the extra one that is being included is offline air gap of immut or immutable. Why is that added? Because of also of ransomware. It is not sufficient anymore to have one 
backup copy, for example, of site or at another location, but it is still online or not air-gapped or not immutable, because if you are impacted by ransomware, it is all impacted that is possible. So if you have an offline air-gapped or immutable option, then you have still an option uh, to recover uh, correct data. I will explain it a bit more in the next slide. And then and the last zero, uh, that means that it is not sufficient only to have good backups, but they need to be tested. Eh? Okay, you restore sometimes a virtual machine or, or a couple of files or so, but it has to be an, um, it has to be scheduled. And Veeam has an, uh, a feature, sure backup is called to automate this and uh, how just uh, just uh, short how does it work it is just uh, spinning up your vms that from the last backup that is created in a sandbox environment and it can be tested on a on a health check on a ping test and even checks on uh, open ports or open services so you know if you have to restore your backups for some reason and it's a disaster or ransomware whatever you know that your backups are working and if you are doing that on a scheduled monthly basis then you are pretty sure your backups are yeah. running fine i see a lot of companies uh, are still afraid of using uh, data labs eh? the formal sure backup uh it's too complicated uh, it's it's not really not that complicated once you do it uh, one time uh, you really know the ins and outs of how to configure it and uh, it will really save you and give you a, a good state of mind if your backup is uh, is recoverable as of now and especially i want to come back on that uh, air capped and immutable aspects uh, mm -hmm. the second one uh, we see a lot of insurance companies now asking them uh is is it's, required. Doing, it's, it's a requirement to get the, to get an insurance so uh, yeah, uh, pay attention to that as well. Indeed. So we have needed we have needed an offline air gap or immutable. What are the options? It is not limited. So after this slide, I will ask if someone wants to add uh, something about it or, or give a feedback or so. One option that is already being used for a long time are tapes. And there was there was a period. Uh, there was a time that. Tapes were not that popular anymore, but with the beginning of ransomware, tapes are very popular these days. Uh, because if you eject them and you bring them or transport them off-site, then you have a real air-gapped solution. It's no problem. Be aware that you have, of course, um, I always advise that, that you have, in case of a disaster, a second a tape drive with, that can read the same LTO uh, because a tape drive can only read two uh, or before I think three uh, generations of LTO. So be aware and nowadays as you know in the COVID it was not always easy to have an, uh, a rental, yeah, yeah. rental or disaster, a disaster tape drive or so. So if you have them on your own you're not dependent if you are having a uh, disaster. Warm tapes are also an option. Use rotating disks in the SMB market that is very often used because of the low end price. Eh? You can use it more or less at the same, at this, in the same way as you are using tapes, but with that advantage that you're not depending on a tape drive. Eh? You, are, uh, you plug it in on your, uh, on your laptop and you can recover your Veeam data uh, if you want to. But as I already mentioned it, be aware that you encrypt them because you don't want to have a rotated disk or a USB disk as you know from home and uh, putting in the wrong hands. Then you can recover your whole infrastructure without any password and that you don't want to. Uh, immutable public cloud storage, of course, object storage is for very popular, like Wasabi or uh, AWS uh, or Azure is a possibility. Be aware of the egress costs, of course, uh, at the bandwidth. Um, use also cloud repository at the service provider with immutability or insider protection. From my perspective, that is the best option because you are uh, have a trust relationship with your partner with your service provider uh, mostly that is located in a secure data center it is a service that the partner is offering 
so they have the expertise with it. Uh, it comes with, with some money, of course, and not, not nothing for nothing. Uh, but in my opinion, that's one of the best solutions. Uh, a user hardened Linux repository is, of course, also a possibility, but be aware that in case there is something wrong, you have some Linux expertise, or you can use on-premise immutable object storage, what in my opinion will become more and more popular the coming years, but now at this stage, it's still like, very expensive, especially for in the SMB market, but there will be solutions that will be more um, acceptable for, for this kind of uh, company. And as an extra layer, you can also implement storage snapshots. But uh, be aware, it's not an, uh, an alternative of a backup. It's not a backup, but in some cases, we already had it with some customers, it can help you in case of ransomware, where, uh, a snapshot, where the hacker or ransomware was not able to get in your storage um, management and they could not delete the storage snapshots so you can easily revert and yeah revert yeah. on a yeah. fast way of course yeah. but it's no it's not sufficient it's an extra layer therefore I, I put it on there but be sure so there is one backup copy that is at least offline air gapped or immutable other people who want to add something to it so we are probably or for example, forgotten some. I have some uh, some nice new features yes. in version 12 yeah. regarding the aspect of immutability and, and air gap and so on. Um, I will touch on that uh, later on. But if there are any questions, feel free. Eh? Um, yeah, just unmute yourself and um, speak up. No problem. If you want to do it in Dutch, it's also no problem. We will translate it then yeah. afterwards uh, in English so everybody can understand it. So if not, just no problem afterwards at the end of the session you can also yeah. uh, do the necessary normally we don't die at the end of the session so you we are yeah. still available Hopefully. for some uh, yeah. for some questions okay. all right so hardening your veeam backup and replication server that's one thing you can do to make it uh, potential hackers or ransomware as difficult as possible it's not possible to eliminate the possibility that ransomware is getting in your company or hackers are getting in your company you know all it is all possible it depends mostly on the end users that are having a little that are clicked on a wrong link whatever but if your backups are you are as secure as possible it's good so it can be um done the the hacker or the uh, ransomware to perform their um, their uh, their activities their faulty activities so first of all especially in the smb markets put your veeam backup and application in a work group and don't make it uh, a joinable in a domain for the large enterprises mostly that is uh, in a separate management domain so that means that you have uh, you have to have uh, separate uh, domain controllers in that dom in that uh, domain, but in the SMB market that is mostly not done because it costs too much money, uh, also a lot of uh, manageability you have to do, but it can help you to manage it eh, by using uh, group policies and so on, multiple users you can manage, and in a work group that is not that uh, easy. Secondly, uh, rename your default administrator account. It's just a simple thing. Eh? They do, do not use administrator itself because the tools are firstly using to get in with that uh, name, with that administrator a name, call it something else. Um, next to it, disable your RDP if possible. Um, and just use, in, in case of a physical backup server, use your ELO from HP or your IDREC from Dell or EPME from another brand to get in your um, to get in your Veeam backup and replication. Because the second, the, the next thing, in my opinion, you don't need to log in to your Veeam backup and replication server ever, except for two things: 
just one thing is to install Windows updates. And secondly, to upgrade your VM. That's it. For the rest, do it remotely. You use the remote VM console, install that on a VM, on a management server or so, and that is connecting with another port to your VM backup and replication and do it with a regular user. A regular user that you created it on your VM backup and replication that is not a domain, that is not a local administrator account. Mm -hmm. So if you are using that account and it is sniffed or whatever that it, uh, the, the hacker is uh, using, uh, it has still no access as an administrator on your backup server. So that's a better way to do yeah. it. So you don't need to put in all every time your credentials of your local administrator of your backup server. Um, use limited and needed permissions, of course, for people needing access. Uh, that's also not very, uh, that cannot be applied in the NSMB market because most of the times there is only one or two or three persons in IT. But in larger, larger enterprises, uh, you, you have people that just have to be able to restore something but not change uh, anything in the Veeam backup replication. So just be aware that those people can only restore something and no performing upgrades or uh, changing uh, enter, uh, uh, certain things in the Veeam backup replication. Of course, use strong, unique passwords. So don't use a password, eh? one, two, three, four, and so use a it's strong. Most, it's still the most popular uh, around, yeah, so know, but why not? Yeah, I think you know why. <laughs> Try to use complex, long passwords, and also, but I see too often, use it unique. Just a unique password only, only for that theme backup and application server, and do not use it for, for example, for other local administrators of other servers. Try to use uh, v VM, uh, uh, Microsoft has a free tool for that, Labs, to, to, to put in new uh, local administrator accounts. Okay, it's a domain joint, but you can do it for all your domain joint no. servers and for your backup server, try to use a separate for that. Something not really to do with Veeam backup and application, but if your Veeam backup and application should be a virtual server, Disable your SS hash at your vSphere vCenter and on your hosts. Because in that way you can put down your yeah, you it's can reducing the attack surface of, uh, of your infrastructure. Indeed. Next to that, disable unneeded services. First of all, disable all the services you don't use on a Veeam backup application. Just for example, a print spooler, you don't print something from it. There was also a vulnerability from Microsoft uh, last year. Print the print things like that. Yeah. So you can avoid those things. Yeah. RDP, and there are some more. And afterwards, and in a couple of next slides, I will show you uh, something more about that in version 12 that is possible. But it can be already uh, accomplished over here, but I will uh, mention it there. Do not install third-party software on the Veeam backup and application. Unfortunately, I see that too often. So just use your Veeam backup and application just for Veeam backups, and that's it. The trash can of the network. Yes, and indeed. Luckily, it's getting better and better nowadays. Okay. But yeah. before, it was a management server doing everything, also including backups. Yeah. That is not anything anymore that should be allowed to these days. Then updates Windows updates regularly to avoid exploits. Yeah, I don't have to mention it that, but why do I put it over here? I'm not the biggest fan to uh, install Windows updates automatically on a Windows backup, on a backup server. Why is that? Yeah, normally in, norm, uh, in normal circumstances, Windows updates are being installed automatically by using whatever software at night. And when does it happen? The backup window. Yes, indeed, in the yeah. same backup window. So you don't want to uh, combine those two. And also, it's, bad, it's the best way to update. You just check before you, up, you install your updates. Are all run, are our jobs uh, are stopped? 
are they running correctly then you have also a view on your backup infrastructure you put it all disabled and then no new backup job will start then you can do it your backups you reboot your server i know it's not always necessary to reboot it after installing windows updates but do it anyway is the time to do it because rebooting a server is most of the time very good eh? once in a while to do that um so do it like that um and next to that don't forget it it's also the time to do the update for your drivers and firmware updates also there are a lot of exploits uh in those firmware so that is also the time i i, I advise to do it yeah at least two two times a year yeah, yeah, yeah. for a physical backup service so i think that's that's really when, when you have so, so those exploits uh, and yeah check them scale them and uh yeah if it's necessary uh, apply them uh, as soon as possible uh, but the regular six month check update check would be would be nice yeah it's always uh, the first thing you get when you get open up a support ticket are you on the latest firmware level so that's one of the first uh, uh, questions they ask in the end uh, you have to Indeed. you have to be uh, on the on the latest version as well i will do now the part two uh, and then i will listen for uh, any um yeah questions questions remarks. or answer uh, yeah, yeah remarks so um, something I also often see that is forget, forgotten uh, when you are having a physical backup server, don't forget to backup also the OS of your backup server itself because that's a Windows server because the backup application needs to be installed on a Windows server. And as you know, the Windows updates are not always that ideal. And so, yeah. yeah. Um, so if you restart your server and for for some reason it can't start anymore or it, it's behaving not properly, you can restore it with a Veeam uh, backup bare metal recovery using uh, the recovery media. So don't forget that. Also implement network segmentation. Um, why? Because put it as, in a simple way, put it in your management VLAN. That is a VLAN where everything is situated. None of the other ones except IT has something to do with it. So it, it is um, secured by a firewall between it. So you can only open the ports only needed that are uh, yeah, that all are needed. So try to do that. Um, it costs time and money to implement that, but you are a bit secured. If you are using not local storage as a, as a repository, but the nice QZLearn, for example, don't forget that you have also some um, features to make it a bit secure, like using a CHOP account and host limitations. Use it, use that. Uh, of course, do not forget to enable the Windows firewall, I know. Uh, it happens often, something is not working correctly, put the Windows firewall off, it is working, okay, fine, that's good to test or troubleshoot, but enable it again afterwards and try to find out which port is being blocked or whatever, and try to uh, create that rule necessary to open only the necessary what is needed. And don't forget to enable antivirus, um, Veeam has a KB article for that, with all the exclusions needed to implement. Otherwise, the antivirus can yeah, put a, a load on your, um, on your performance if it is not correctly set up. So for example, the drive where your backups are located, you have to exclude that. Otherwise, yeah. it is constantly checking for that and you don't want that. You want that your uh, backups are uh, really fast done. Um, I already mentioned it before, encryption, use it when needed. So if it is removable, whatever, uh, or not uh, physically secured, do you use it. And not to forget to copy your Veeam configuration backup to a secondary repository. Um, I often use just a file copy uh, job to do that because it's not built in yet. 
I already asked uh, Veeam to implement it, but it's can, not. You it's can not use a file copy job, which is over there for ages. So uh, yeah, but there's a one yeah. disadvantage about it's it. It's not a checkbox. Yeah. yeah, it's not a checkbox only, but there is also a second disadvantage about using that. That is, he is copying and he is he is adding to the to the to the targets. Yeah. So. In the beginning, if, if you set up that you are um, that you are holding 20 restore points, for example, in your of your theme configuration backup, then he will put the 20 restore points over the target. But then it's adding, adding, adding. So yeah, yeah, yeah. at last you have to delete some, uh, do manually, or yeah. you can use a script to to, to put it. But allez, it yeah. should be more uh, convenient to have one single okay. uh, checkbox. I will ask uh, ChatGPT for that. Yeah, uh, to do it. Totally. Uh, has someone ju just one more question? Has someone uh, has someone remarks or questions about uh, the hardening of the Veeam backup replication? Not yet. Okay, then a couple of small new V12 features in securing your Veeam backup replication. The first one is now it is possible to implement MFA. The MFA, that is one checkbox, it is configured for all users. If you want to use it, you have to remove every group that has having access, otherwise it won't work. But you can, for specific users, disable it, like for, for example, for a service account. So that's a very good thing uh, that is uh, Veeam now implemented in version 12. Implement it because it gives you again yeah. an extra layer of security. And the next one is now it is possible to have group managed service accounts. Why is that? If you are using application awareness, then you have to put in in the Veeam backup replication uh, in the Windows account where you can have at least local administrator uh, credentials, uh, local administrator permissions to go in the VM to yeah. have VSS let do your job. But of course, that is located in the database of Veeam backup replication. Those credentials. And now, if you are using group managed service account, that is not needed anymore. So, it's a new feature yeah. that probably I think will and also there in terms of security. Yeah, additional security is implemented over there. And at last, now they have implemented the best practice analyzer. It's a built-in tool to check the security for best practices. Some of them I already explained, and so. Uh, there are some else, so for, for example, Windows Firewall, he's checking if it is enabled or not, if MFA is enabled or not, immutable copy and so on. Also, for example, the remote registry service, that is one I was not, uh, I did not uh, yet uh, explain it, but it should be also um, disabled. So that's a very good thing. And uh, Veeam already mentioned it, it that they will, um, add new uh, checks within and i also uh, did a feature request because now it's just a, a standalone check you have to put on the button yeah. to, to run it and i already asked to uh, schedule it or it is possible for example that um, on a monthly basis there is an automatically check and you can get a report for that for example someone is doing something uh, on your Veeam backup application, he is turning on the remote registry service for some reason and he forgot to disable it again, yeah. then you don't know it anymore because you have run that for once and then you don't During know it anymore. So, yes. yeah. so then you have a reminder that something is okay. being turned off. Nice feature. Uh, yeah, you got indeed. my vote on the forums on that as well. Thank uh, you. So now it's Christophe. Okay. Turn. Um, we will talk about uh, V12, uh, not about engines, uh, but about the latest version of uh, Veeam, of course. And um, I can tell you, um, I, I, we still have some time left, but uh, only talking about the latest versions. It's only a 32-page PDF document, uh, just talking about what's new. So I could talk for ages uh, when I want to touch up on all the topics which are new in, uh, in version 12. 
but I have uh, made a, a small selection, and uh, that uh, yeah, that's a selection based on my experience, on Nico's experience, the, the feedback we got from customers, some uh, some features which are really handy, which are really important to know, but also really handy uh, to put them in place and to be uh, to give you the uh, the extras. Why should you uh, upgrade or why should you implement version 12? Um, and what is nice to have in the, in this new uh, new release. First of all, um, we have a we are talking about the data platform uh, these days. Uh, and we have three flavors of them. Uh, we have the foundation, uh, and, and things will stay the same. Uh, we still have backup and recovery, and that is the foundation, that's the base. Uh, the second uh, flavor of our data platform is called the advanced version. And then, uh, yeah, uh, I'm talking about products, and then we are putting a VBR together with, with Theme One. Uh, you, you get all the, the nifty features, reports, follow up, forecasting from Veeam 1 with the monitoring and analytics services which are included in the Veeam 1 product and together it's the uh, the advanced data platform and of course we talk about the premium version when we also add to that platform uh, the, the VBR and the Veeam 1 also the recovery orchestration uh, uh, software or suites uh, to that and that makes us that we have now have a data platform and within the versions VBR will still uh, have is standard enterprise and enterprise plus but if we are combining products we are talking about the data platform that's uh, the last technical slide i have i'm going into the bits and bytes right on yeah and just to add something the essential suite will also still be available yeah of course yeah, yeah. the essentials is uh, very important is there. for the smb market, SMB market uh, a lot of implementations over there yeah. Uh, maybe one of the biggest e announcements in uh, version 12 is uh, the direct backup to object storage. So now we can, no, yeah, we, we don't have to put our backups uh, first on a local storage or data store. We can immediately start storing them in object storage. Also, there uh, these days six flavors are supported, and, and oh, yeah, more of them uh, since we have support for S3 compatible storage. We go much further than only those brands, uh, but that's uh, that's uh, it's an important um, uh, point uh, that yeah, and an in, in S3 storage, object storage. Uh, and most of the times, the pay-as-you-go uh, formula uh, that you only pay what what you allocate. Uh, it gives you flexibility, no additional upfront investment. Um, in Belgium, I always make the remark: think about restoring, uh, fetching data from there. You get ingress, outgress costs on some of them, uh, of some of these providers. But also in Belgium, we don't have that much high-speed bandwidth. And if I want to restore two terabytes, uh, I can get more than one coffee until I get my data <laughs> back on site. So that's also always a remark I want to make. It's good, I, for example, for GFS points, long-term archiving, but keep a certain set of data, a set of backups locally when you need to perform very fast restores of quite large uh, um, amounts of, uh, of data or uh, virtual mach machines. This means that, uh, yeah, uh, classically, when we want to um, put data in an S3 object storage or an S3 object storage um, uh, uh, location, we need to configure a, a sober uh, scale-out backup repository. That's no longer the case. You can just create one job and just push it automatically to the uh, to the external object storage provider. To add something about that, in my opinion, in the Belgian market. Um, what will become popular and is recommended, I think, is not to use direct uh, direct backup to object storage as a primary job, yeah. but use it for a copy job. Copy, backup, so, copy job. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you have the time uh, to, to put in your copy from your backup repository, your primary backup repository on premise to the cloud, because uh, you already mentioned it, the, yeah. the limited bandwidth. Uh, and you don't want to have your snapshots on your primary backup job long open. Yeah, you don't yeah. want that. Yeah, yeah. So okay. I think that is uh, something to take away. That's really an interesting point uh, in your upcoming uh, designs and, uh, yes. and ways you are going to implement it. The second one, uh, the abbreviation uh, SOS API. Does somebody know what SOS is? A part of Save Our Souls? No? It's not save our souls. It's uh, smart object storage, and uh, that's that's yeah, quite a technical thing. Uh, but the SOS API is an extension of the S3 uh, API, uh, which is developed uh, with Veeam and some of their partners. 
and it builds, it's compatible with S3 storage, but it builds upon uh, the, the standard S3 API calls. Smart object storage, okay, what is it? Uh, uh, who, who is using it? Uh, who is providing this? Um, it's very simple. Um, it's not something new. You can have your bucket and make it smart object storage compatible. And it's just when you go into that bucket, you will see that two XML files are dropped in there. And in this example, you see the capacity.xml and the system.xml. And um, depending, it's still a, a young standard, depending on the future developments, more and more features are go coming available when you are writing uh, to not only object storage, but smart object storage. Uh, one of them, and you already can see that in version 12, uh, you see there that small uh, blue bucket uh, icon over there. It's S3 integrated. It's not S3 compatible. It's integrated. Now we can uh, already see the free space which is still available in this uh, in this bucket. That is, uh, we have to think this information to that capacity.xml file which is written a part of the S3. So that gives a lot of flexibility in developing new features. Um, one of the new features will be smart entities. Eh? Uh, smart entities, uh, we can set, and I'm a, for example, I'm a storage provider. Um, I can control some defaults, uh, setting and filling in these values in these, uh, these APIs. They are not mandatory. You can select whatever you want as a, a storage provider, but one of them, uh, for example, can be the block size. And now it's recommended to have a one meg block in, uh, in your environment, but maybe there are some storage systems that uh, have a better performance or are or, or more happy with four meg blocks. Then the storage provider with the SOS API can force it to the, uh, to the customer who is using this storage objects. We just click next, next, finish, and he gets this information and immediately his configuration is, is adopted to the most performant block size in, uh, in this example. It's quite technical, but we still uh, are going to hear a lot of this. There are already providers using this. Uh, one of these are, for example, uh, Claudian Object First uh, with their OOTB uh, yeah. uh, appliance. Exoscale, uh, uh, Scality, uh, they are all moving into supporting one or the other form of SOS API. Uh, another nice thing, uh, uh, we, we went on, uh, on Vimo where we saw it in a real live demo, uh, the trusted immutability, uh, we are talking about Linux hardened repositories. Keep in mind, this is important. And when you want to have a local repository which is hardened, yeah, you, you, you can do it completely in Linux. And there are uh, there is a very extended script and also extended documentation available in the community on the forums how to harden your uh, your Linux repo. But uh, there is also a Vim employee called Hannes uh, Hannes Kasperik. Uh, who uh, set up a complete uh, ISO file. And this can be interesting to play with or to test it yourself. The ISO file is a stripped down version of Ubuntu, um, which uh, gives you the ability to, you need, a, you need a piece of hardware, of course, eh, with two partitions. That's the main requirement, two partitions, one for the operating system, the second one is your, uh, is your data store. So you decide which rate level and things like that you want to configure on, uh, on that, uh, on that uh, infrastructure. And as soon as this is, uh, um, uh, ISO is installed, it will go to a completely automated script written by, uh, by Hannes, which will harden this repository. It's uh, based on standards, on international standards, the DISA uh, uh, STIG standard. So it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's bulletproof. Um, it's even that bulletproof when you reboot the server, you can only there have two options, shutdown or reboot. You don't have any other options anymore to work on that operating system. It's, it's quite uh, stripped down. Um, one advantage of this system can be uh, that when you um, yeah, lose your password or use connectivity of need an upgrade, just uh, remove the uh, operation on the, the operating system disk, just flush that disk, reinstall it, and your data store will remain intact and you can still have access to your, uh, to your um, uh, data and to your repository. So it's really important, hardened repos, when you have some uh, uh, decent level of Linux knowledge available, uh, look into this, uh, that can be make the life of hackers uh, much more uncomfortable than, uh, than just storing it on, on, uh, on uh, another type of, uh, of storage. 
as I already mentioned, uh, having a certain level of Linux skills is uh, uh, preferable um, when you have to do some troubleshooting and you've never seen Linux um, uh, from, from a very close distance, it's hard to troubleshoot. So, yeah, play with it and see if it's beneficial for you, yes or no. Um, also, a new thing eh, in, uh, in 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 the in the version 12 is the Postgres uh, version 14 data uh, database. Um, in the past, we had our VBR server, which was based on SQL Server Express, yes. version 2012 until 9.5 uh, update 4, and then we got to SQL Express 2016. Indeed. We still have some limitations over there. It's SQL Express, okay, it's a free version, but only two v max two vCPUs, four gigs of RAM, and ten gigs of yes. uh, of, uh, of of data store or, or database capabilities. So if you want, don't want to break the bank, um, you can shift now to Postgres. Um, it's free and it's uh, it's uh, and doesn't have any of those limitations in terms of CPUs, memory, and things like that any longer. So today, when you install a, an, a, a plain vanilla V12, it will come with Postgres. Yeah, it's the default now. It's, the, it's, it's really it's the default. You can still use uh, the SQL Express. You have to select it. Uh, or, a are, full, or a full SQL is also or possible. Full SQL. No uh, one thing I always mention to customers is, okay, I want to restore SharePoint databases. Keep yeah. in mind that indeed, you have the it. limitation of the database. Uh, that's yeah, uh, that's an important thing. Um, when we uh, when we uh, use an upgrade path uh, and there is a SQL Express, it will just upgrade and the SQL Express will it remain. Will be used. It will be still uh, still. And there is a possibility to convert it. But yeah. it's not recommended to do it with for large uh, databases. Yeah. You just do it for small. Yeah, I got a workaround that Fimoma talked to a guy who did several upgrades, and he said, "Okay, uh, when I do, uh, I have an, an uh, for example, a uh, version 11. I do an export of the configuration. Yeah. I set up a completely new VBR." Uh, plain Post vanilla yeah. based on Postgres, and then I import the configuration. That can be migration uh, path nice as well. alternative. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, one small thing. Postgres. Postgres. Uh, very nice. Uh, this is a, a picture I took at uh, Mike Ressler's presentation of uh, Microsoft 365 backup. Also there, things are moving in the next versions, um, and you see also their configuration uh, database meta uh, uh, data will be stored in a central database. And they are also looking into other um, types of databases. Today is in a JET database. Yes. Uh, we are now, they are also looking into Postgres as well. So it can be a logical evolution that more and more things are will uh, be the default for will be a default. more and more products. Yeah. One remark, uh, Vim 1 these days is still on SQL. Yeah. That's, uh, that's also uh, nice to know or to keep in mind. Um, the new backup uh, chain metadata format, an important one uh, from my perspective, and in the next slide it, it will give you a lot of more features. Classically, um, we had our backup chain, eh? we had our VBM file, the backup metadata file, and we had the VBK file, the backup format, and the VIB files, the incrementals, and these were also monolithic blocks, monolithic files on uh, residing on uh, on your repository. Later on, we moved that uh, the, the the per machine backup, and eh? there was an option you can uh, you can activate. You had to take a full backup to activate that. But then we already had some backup change uh, chains uh, per VM, uh, which gave more flexibility. But the VBM file was still a one one single one file. Job. Yeah. Yeah, one per job. one per job. One per job. And now in the new version, we have for each machine have, they have their own metadata file. Very nice, you should say. Hey, more files on on my repo. What's the advantages of this? Well, I come immediately to this. Now we have the VMover. Eh? People of marketing are always very nice with their names. We have yeah. the VMover <laughs> uh, um, uh, possibility now. And this uh, VMover possibility, and this is a screenshot, it will give us the possibility to move backups, to move them from one repo to the other on a machine level. So we can really shift the, our machines and not taking new backups or an, an intermediate job or things like that. Something nice to add about that, if you are moving from, for example, an SMB share, what is bad, bad practice anyway, mm -hmm. and you move it to an REFS with fast cloning or an XFS with fast cloning, yeah. you have the gain 
afterwards of this fast cloning. Of the fast cloning. Yeah. Yeah. Before it was impossible to do that. Yeah. And another advantage of the uh, true per VM, because they call it now uh, this way, yeah. is you can now create an active foo just for one VM. Yeah. That was also not possible before. You had to do it for the whole job. The whole job. Uh, yeah. So it's more flexible. Yeah. Yeah, this this is really a nice yeah. nice to know, and and I think in in the end uh, a lot of people will uh, will start using uh, using this. Well, some small uh, things I want to touch up on, uh, so I want to go quickly through it. Uh, we can now have multiple internet rules. Uh, it's nice nice to know, especially again in Belgium where we have some yeah. limitations. Okay, we do our copy job, but during production hours, during day, we will limit it. We will not stop it. We will not pause it. We will go through, but at, but a, at, at a, a lower, lower throttled uh, bandwidth. So that's uh, that's nice uh, nice to to have. And also here, Ed, uh, I already talked about it. The the, the time based throttling level, nice. This is a really Absolutely. nice uh, nice feature. And in also version 12. the restore activity now that is not limited anymore. Yeah, yeah. Because before. It was also uh, throttled. Yeah, and it was one restore rule for everything. You yeah. want to restore it as soon as possible, eh? mostly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a, that's a really an important checkbox. Uh, never throttle a restore activity. Um, maybe uh, some cheekiness from my side, but symbolic links you can back up and restore them now. And you also have now file level, uh, file level recovery for Windows. But yeah, the, the file level recovery for Windows that's been there for ages. But these are the nice features now. We can restore permissions only. And I'm talking about uh, being a system administrator myself. Um, and I think a lot of us uh, can, can uh, uh, agree on that. It's very easy to uh, push down changes in a Windows file system. You, as a system administrator, are working on a, on a file server and a user needs to have access to a certain uh, directory, but there is still inheritance activated on that on that tree. Yeah, and, and you you do a misclick and yeah, there you have it, the permissions. People are still working on it. They are accessing files, files are open. With this tool, we can easily uh, now just restore it, yeah. we revert it and they will never That's know. That's a very nice feature yeah. that. Yeah. That's, this is really a, a Hopefully you saver. never use it, but... Yeah. I, I think it's really an ass yeah, saver yeah, for yeah, yeah, admins. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Also, when you are restoring a lot a set of files, you can do a compare with production now yeah. and only the changed files. So also there in terms of, of speed, in terms of uh, what files are being touched, are overwritten, uh, only the change file can be very easily checked uh, with the compare to production uh, functionality for the file recovery in, uh, in Windows. Absolutely. Um, I think we are almost at the, at the last uh, things I want to talk about. Uh, we have the recovery tokens. Um, you have the bare metal recovery. Yeah? You have the the, the self uh, the, the the bootable image uh, yeah. to perform a, a bare metal restore. Um, maybe you are in a large organization and you have a branch office where there is an IT guy, but you are the master of the backups. Yeah, you want to give them some kind of freedom to do some bare metal recovery of their data. Now you can give them a token uh, which can expire, which is, is, is a, it's a one-time uh, token to perform and to get access to your repository to pull down your backup from a bare uh, metal uh, recovery. So that's uh, also nice to know, I think. Yeah, uh, the big companies that will be very yeah. nice. Yeah. And last but not least, uh, now in the workstation and the workstation agent, we also have the CBT, eh, the change block tracking, where we only back up the blocks that are changed and not scanning the whole disk, only the blocks uh, are, are uh, taken in, uh, into the backup. It's now also part of the uh, workstation agent, where it was in the past only reserved for the server agent. So. Also, in terms of speed, that will usually increase uh, taking backups from uh, from workstations. So yeah, uh, that's more or less it. Um, there are, of course, a, a lot of more features, but yeah, I want to keep within the hour. I still have two minutes left. I see. Just in um, perfect timing. Um, if there are any questions, remarks, or things you want to talk about, uh, feel free unmute yourself and let us know. Or also suggestions for a next topic. Yeah. 
also we are looking for our, uh, our to... next POG top, uh, event and I think it will be an in-person event probably yeah maybe uh, uh, setting up the hardened repo as fast as possible in teams of two players to each other I don't know perhaps no questions so far everything clear then okay then uh, we will wrap it up yeah or we will pause the recording or stop the recording if you don't want it to be recorded your question is also possible and because okay so I will stop the recording and then uh, we can uh, wrap it up uh, thanks everybody for your attention and uh, talk to you soon bye yeah bye thank you